So it says you're live on your screen? Yeah, it says I'm live everywhere. I'm live via Zoom. Um, I'm... Oh, there we go. Let's see. Oh. So it says you're live on your screen. Okay, we're, we're good. Yeah. I'm live everywhere. I'm live via Zoom. Awesome. It was just a lag. Yeah. Um, okay. We're live. <laughs> That's awesome. Sorry about that technical uh, snafu there at the beginning. Not entirely sure what happened, but here we are. Uh, we're going to wait for folks to be able to get on uh, onto the stream again in case they had to pop off wondering what was the deal. So we'll wait for this to just stabilize a little bit and then we'll get started. I do in fact have a fun little splash screen for you tonight, uh, which should now be up on the screen there. Uh, we're starting to have folks pick up. So this is all good, and I'm seeing some feedback from the chat, so excellent. How are you two tonight, Noah and Andrew? We're doing pretty good. How about you, Andrew? Good, good. Excited to get started. <laughs> Indeed. Gorgeous, gorgeous. <laughs> cool. Uh, as it is five after, I think we should just jump right in and get on started. So everyone, welcome to the first Universe at Home uh, of the fall semester 2020. We're glad to be back. Took a little bit of a hiatus there. Uh, just want to plug something with some uh, partners of ours real quick. The International Observe the Moon Night is this Saturday, 926. Uh, it's a big, you know, deal organized by NASA. Feel free to go and look that up and check it out. They let us know that it was coming up, so we figured we'd let you know that uh, there are going to be a bunch of events, some live streams, a bunch of information about how you can go out and observe the moon. It's supposed to be gorgeous. And now, at long last, I... Uh, Welcome. I am Alexander Criswell. I'm a second year PhD student in astrophysics at the University of Minnesota. I actually study gravitational waves, which is the topic of this. <clears throat> and my co-presenters are. Hi, everyone. My name is Noe Basan, or you can call me Noah. I'm a junior studying aerospace engineering, and I'm also a lab TA for Astronomy 101 Exploring the Universe. Hello, I'm Andrew Toivonen, and I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Minnesota, and I will also be studying gravitational wave um, related physics and, you know, neutron star and black hole mergers. So, all right. Welcome, Fantastic. everyone. Let's get started with black holes, neutron stars, and other things that go bump in the night. So you've heard us mention gravitational waves a couple of times. I said, it's what I work on. Andrew said, it's what he works on. And I referenced it as the topic of this talk, but what are they? Uh, in a very basic way, they are quite literally ripples in the fabric of space-time. They are produced any time that a mass accelerates. I, right now, and producing extremely small gravitational waves that we would never be able to see in a million years. But I'm making them, I'm accelerating the mass of my hand. Uh, if you have something that is much, much more massive and energetic, we can actually hear these gravitational waves as they spread out through the universe. How, you might ask? Well, let me tell you. We basically take uh, some several kilometers or several mile long lasers and we carefully, very carefully watch the length of those lasers because of course the speed of light is always going to be the same. So the amount of time the laser takes to get all the way down to one end and come all the way back will change if the length of these long, long lasers changes slightly as a gravitational wave slightly squeezes or expands the physical space that the laser is in. Uh, the sort of precision that you have to have to be able to do something like this is equivalent to if you took a single strand of hair from your head, put it up next to your house, and then scaled the entire thing down to the size of a proton. The difference between 
the width of a human hair and the size of a house is the change of the length of these lasers that we see with respect to a proton. It's wild that we can actually do it, but I'm very happy that we can. So what do we hear? Behind there, you see uh, one of the gravitational wave detectors in all of its glory. That's the Virgo detector. We can hear black holes. Uh, so black holes are a singularity. It's something that has become so massive and so dense that it's collapsed down to a single point and not even light can escape its gravitational grasp. These things form in the depth in the deaths of extremely massive stars. And as some folks have theorized, they could have even formed in the very beginnings of the universe, which would be something called a primordial black hole. The first gravitational waves that we ever saw were from two black holes merging together in a distant galaxy. And you can actually see the signal that we saw in the detectors right there. Those little swoop upwards are called chirps. And that is what shows up in the detector uh, when we see two black holes merging. And Noah, you are definitely- Hi, everyone. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be presenting a little bit about neutron stars. So it turns out that even though stars can be massive, none all of them can achieve that number uh, to get to become a black hole. In other situations, it tends to happen that the mass of the atomic nucleus becomes the size of New York City. And it becomes like two or times the like, it becomes so compressed that even it can be made of hyperdense, mostly just neutrons. So this is just what we call a neutron star. After an explosion of a star becoming supernova, it just becomes this very rapidly spinning object that becomes, um, as you can go in the next slide, please. It can become super massive. If you get close to it, like it will fry most of it, most of the cables within your spacecraft. And even when two neutron stars collide, like you can generate a lot of gravitational waves. That's how massive they are. They go on an entangled dance and as they get closer together and um, close the circle between each other, they create gen gen gravitational waves and also light. And these mergers end up being called kilonovae. Actually, the first one that we detected was back in 2017. And these are some of the images of how we, it would actually be represented from an artist's point of view. Next. So what's the thing with neutron stars? They actually spin very quickly. And even um, and due to this rapid spin, they are relatively flat. And I say it relatively because like they're round. But even a mountain of it on a neutron star, it would just be like very, very small. It would like move billions of miles per hour. And like just a small, amount of, um, yeah. So a star, neutron star with a mountain, such a mountain would emit gravitational waves. And actually the surges are keep, keep on going actually. But okay, there's another aspect within um, the universe that is in every galaxy, not only in our own Milky Way, and that's called supermassive black holes. These are massive beings, billions of times the mass of our actual sun. As I mentioned, they're located in the center of every galaxy, including our own Milky Way. And these, as you may have heard, actually suck up a lot of light. Even like we tend to represent them mostly in science fiction, as you can see on the bottom right, with interstellar, but we were able last year to take an actual image from the Messier 87 galaxy. And that is 53 million light years away. So imagine how much of an effort it took to get that image and have an actual representation of how 
a black hole actually is. But now, imagine like if we were able to detect like these long deficits from um, long before we actually get to see the explosion, not after. Well, there's a project called LISA and LISA will be a satellite that will be able to detect most of these um, dances of black holes and neutron stars. Um, and as they get closer and plunge into a supermassive black hole, it would allow scientists to determine how a spacetime works close to a supermassive black hole. Because of these ripple, this ripples in spacetime, you can see these gravitational waves going through and it would be interesting to analyze all of them. And moreover, it will further confirm Einstein's predictions that he made more than 100 years ago. Now I'm muted. Uh, another fascinating object that is out there is a white dwarf. Uh, you'll notice the, the pattern here. A lot of these, not all of them, but a lot of these are the result of a dying star. And white dwarfs are the end state of stars like our sun, where the outer layers of our sun will eventually just kind of slough off. And all that will be left is its crystallized carbon oxygen core. Uh, which is going to be roughly, well, in the case of our sun, it won't be quite as massive as the sun. But most white dwarfs are about the size of Earth and about one solar mass, so about the same weight as our sun. There are a ton of white dwarfs in the Milky Way, and many of those are in a binary, which as you've uh, seen when we're talking about black hole binaries or neutron star binaries, are just a pair of the same kind of object orbiting each other around and around and around. There are tens of thousands of white dwarf binaries in the Milky Way, and all of them are humming softly as they slowly but inevitably are spiraling towards each other emitting gravitational waves. And if you take all of them together across the entire galaxy, that future detector, Lisa, that Noah mentioned, those white dwarves all together in their chorus of gravitational waves will be so powerful that it will essentially wash out the detector. And something that I'm currently working on, and I find really interesting, is we need to understand this thing called the white dwarf foreground before we can look for literally anything else because they're all together so loud that they will drown out any other signal if you can't completely understand the signal that you're getting from the white dwarves and get rid of that so that you can look for all of the other amazing things in the universe. On top of that, I learned this pretty recently at a, at a virtual conference, but with Lisa, there are some scientists in the consortium that believe they're going to be able to detect a Jupiter-like planet orbiting around a white dwarf binary all the way out to the Large, Magell uh, Large Magellanic Cloud, which is one of our galaxies, the Milky Way's companion uh, satellite dwarf galaxies. This will be the first detected extragalactic exoplanet, and that sentence just blows my mind. The idea of detecting a planet from another galaxy using ripples in the fabric of space-time is wild. And on top of that, some very recent news from I think yesterday or the day before, someone actually spotted a planet just like this, a, uh, a hot Jupiter-like planet orbiting a white dwarf star. Uh, so a little bit of recent astronomy news for you there. And this picture is from that press release. Finally, we have uh, supernovae, which, you know, we've been talking about high mass stars dying and exploding and producing things like uh, neutron stars and black holes. Well, when they explode, they can also send gravitational waves out through the universe. Unfortunately, uh, these, these gravitational waves are really faint. It, it was a while ago when they were first deciding that 
you know, technology was getting to the point where you could feasibly build a detector for gravitational waves, the folks actually thought that supernovae were going to be the most abundant source. They're very common, stars blow up a lot in a cosmic sense, you know, worry about our sun. Uh, stars blow up pretty frequently. We figured we'd see a lot of these, uh, but the our understanding of the physics of supernovae developed over the time that it took us to actually get gravitational wave detectors online. And by now we've realized that things like binary black holes and binary neutron stars are going to be the main sources of gravitational waves for the current generation of detectors because supernovae are just so faint in gravitational waves that the only way that we could actually see them would be for a star to blow up in our own galaxy, uh, which only happens one, two, three times a century, uh, which, you know, we're due. Uh, last one was in, you know, I, I believe, the early 1900s or late 1800s. So, you know, knock on wood, um, would love to see that. But mm -hmm. they're, they're rare enough that it's not going to be a, a very common, at least, source of gravitational waves. Okay, so this is one of the final sections in which we're going to discuss a little bit about theoretical uncertainties, theoretical objects that might still be wandering around the universe. And one of them is actually boson stars. These are still hypothetical stars, but their concept is pretty exciting because it's made out of bosons what, that, while invisible, they would still be able to produce a massive amount of gravitational waves when they collide with another object. And once we do the, those gravitational waves, we could distinguish like a quark star. And when, like when we collide, like for example, um, yeah, when we observe an object, for example, between a neutron star and a black hole, um, both of them entirely made out of quarks, and yeah, we could distinguish them from like how one of them could actually have like some other quarks and one would be like totally made out of neutrons and it could open new and like new boundaries of what we know about the universe. Yeah. Well, we just flew through that. I was worried I was waxing eloquent, but uh, it appears that we're, end, we're at the end of the talk. I see some excellent questions starting to come into the chat. Uh, Andrew, do you have any of the, uh, the top contenders that you'd like to send over to us now? Yes, I have one here. Um, and do we know how long after launch it will take before Lisa can send what it detects in the future? Uh, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, so Lisa will be launching in, I believe the current timeline is 2034, and it will take about a year to get up and running to the point that we're doing like, actual science and observing with it, because basically the, the folks over on the instrumental side of things need to make sure that everything's working properly so that we don't, you know, have a, a glitch in the detector and end up thinking we're seeing something yeah. that we actually aren't. But after that, it will run for uh, four to eight years is the intended mission with possibilities for extension. Uh, and we'll have that kind of, that window for Lisa to see all these cool things that we discussed earlier. And we also actually had another question that I answered in chat, but maybe you want to talk about a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Does a mountain on a neutron star really move faster than the speed of light? So, no, uh, but they can get close. Um, the fastest spinning neutron star that we know of is spinning at its surface at about 24, I believe, percent of the speed of light. So we can, something on the surface of a neutron star would like, it would be going at relativistic speeds, uh, but likely in the range of 10 to 25% of the speed of light, which is enough to produce a, a big old gravitational wave signal because the neutron star is so um, uh, unbalanced and wobbly at that point that it, it creates a bunch of gravitational waves. 
Also, maybe one thing to put in perspective that neutron stars are actually very tiny, you know, compared mm. to like our star or, so, or our sun, right? Or, you know, stars in the sky because they're so dense. So you may think of, you know, they're rotating so fast, you know, the furthest out point should be moving insanely fast. But, I mean, that's true, but you also have to understand that these are much smaller objects than you think. That's something that actually occurred to me while I was making this, uh, mm -hmm. making these slides is we always call it a mountain on a neutron star, but a neutron star is again about the size of New York City. It's really more of a small hillock uh, as opposed to a mountain because mountains are larger than neutron stars, <laughs> um, at least the particularly big ones. So I think a small hill on top of the neutron star. All right, so we got a couple more questions Excellent. here. Excellent. Um, tell us more about theoretical quark stars, apparently not yet a singularity, but denser than a neutron star. What is the relative density compared with corrupt matter? Oh boy. Uh, so <laughs> these, uh, I will tell you what I know. Uh, we're reaching pretty much the, the far reaches of my own knowledge. These are very, uh, very advanced theoretical constructs and we haven't seen one, but the idea essentially is that it would be an object that could appear similar to a neutron star, but instead of being made primarily out of neutrons, it would be made out of, well, quarks. Um, and it would be just loose quarks all floating around and uh, sustained by, oh geez, uh, I'm, it's been a long time since I've looked at anything that had the words quantum chromodynamics in it. Uh, but it would be sustained by essentially the, the pressure of these quarks. Um, the, the interesting thing here is that it would be an object that would be denser than a neutron star, but past the point where neutron, uh, uh, the, the nuclear pressure wouldn't be able to sustain the star anymore, but theorized states of matter consisting of quarks would be able to still hold up against gravity uh, in a star that would otherwise collapse into a black hole. I do not know what corrupt matter is. Do either of you? I, I've actually never heard of it before, so I'm not sure. I mean, that will be something for us to uh, learn about yeah. later. Great question. Thank you. All right. Um, Elon Musk is launching thousands of satellites. How will that affect any orbiting observatories? Oh, he sure is. Uh, so if you are curious about hearing the effects on astronomy of the Starlink constellations, uh, we are actually going to have a universe at home later uh, this year that will discuss that. So keep an eye out for that little plug. Um, but to directly answer your question, uh, for Lisa specifically, not really. Uh, Lisa is going to be in something called a trailing Earth orbit, um, which means essentially that it will be following Earth's orbit pretty precisely, but just be about 20% uh, of the, the orbital circumference behind Earth. So just kind of lagging it a while, but following the same general orbit. So it will be well away from any Earthbound satellites. Um, as far as other orbiting observatories go, generally people keep pretty good track of where everything is up in space, but that's going to get harder and harder as you know, more things are put into orbit. And I think one of our worst fears as far as orbiting observatories go is that something will hit them and you put a you know, multi-billion dollar piece of equipment up into orbit, you get it working, you get some gorgeous first images and then a piece of space junk slams into it and that's, that's it, it's done, <laughs> game over. Um, but yeah, definitely tune in for our, our talk later this year with uh, folks that know a lot more about that than I do. Uh, Noah, Andrew, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, I think you covered it pretty well, but yeah, I mean, for, you know, orbiting observatories, you know, orbiting ones can have problems, but also we have certain, um, like you said, trailing Earth orbits that if it's outside Earth's orbit, you know, they shouldn't really be affected, but. Yeah. I'd agree. Like I'm, in regards of the different orbits that um, are happen like occur 
like around the Earth, like you have the low Earth orbit, the geotransfer orbit, and also the other orbit that you mentioned that is very close to the Earth, but like it will technically follow its own trajectory. It's not gonna like be rotating around the Earth or something like that. Um, I think the one that it was talking about here, it was like how it would be affecting um, observatories. It's gonna involve a lot of um, space debris, of course, but it has been already discussed um, and mostly established by Elon that it will, SpaceX is taking consideration so that it doesn't affect that much of um, astronomical research that can be done from Earth because um, we're still having a lot of um, space telescopes just from, from the Earth soil. So we just have to ensure that, um, yeah, space debris doesn't get in the way. Okay, and I, I have another question here. We can keep going, so we got lots of questions piling up. Absolutely, let's go. So, hi, I'm a senior, and at the moment, I am preparing for grad school. I really cool. want to do research about neutron stars and awesome. what you're involved with this subject. And I can actually start this one off here. Go um, for it. <laughs> so first of all, as you've heard us, we, we, we work in gravitational wave astronomy, which can also be called multi-messenger astronomy. And by multi-messenger astronomy, we just mean using multiple different, you know, means of observing, whether it's light, you know, cosmic rays, which are just charged particles and gravitational waves, just combining all those. Um, and another field that I actually used to be involved in is nuclear astrophysics. And in that field, um, specifically, I was looking at something called the R process, which has to do with producing um, heavy elements. So something like a, a star similar to the sun, the sun can actually even get all the way up to where, what I'm talking about, but stars in general can only produce elements up to iron, iron being the heaviest element they can produce. And a small um, star like our sun can't even get nearly that high. So everything above iron has to actually be produced in these much more massive, super massive extreme events, such as something like a neutron star merger. So this is, that's part of that field is called nuclear astrophysics. And it's studying, like I said, this R process, the creation of these elements. And also, um, let's just call it more like the equation of state, which is like the, you know, the, the physics governing this, you know, exotic neutron star body, right? That is also, you know, a field in nuclear physics almost because it's, you know, it's a cross between nuclear and astro because it really has a lot of nuclear physics into it. Um, and I, I will, as someone who uh, who works with some of the equation of state stuff, one of my projects is trying to use uh, signals from the, the ring down kind of, of a binary neutron star merger to get at the equation of state. Uh, that's really cool because it boils down to the fact that even though we've said, oh, it's made of neutrons, we don't actually know what a neutron star is made up of exactly. The surface is definitely neutrons, but the interior... Yeah, we don't have physics that can cover that, and we can't get to it in the lab. So the only way to understand the interiors of neutron stars are to look at them doing things out in the universe. Um, so if you're interested in getting into the, the astronomical side of research there, uh, that is an excellent angle, so it's one of the big open questions in the field. But overall, do it. That sounds awesome. Uh, come join us. <laughs> So we got another question here. Do we know how to distinguish a boson star from a quark star through gravitational waves? Ooh, um, so as I understand it, the boson star, the, the problem is not actually, dis well, mm, <laughs> grain of salt. The problem is less distinguishing between a boson star and a quark star and more distinguishing in pairs, black holes and boson stars, and then neutron stars and quark stars, because their gravitational wave signatures are going to look very similar in those two sets. Uh, but there are some differences that the folks who theorize these sorts of things think that we could use to suss out the difference. The reason I backed off on saying that that wasn't really the problem is comparing between the two is because we there are also times where we don't really know if something's a neutron star or a black hole when we see it in gravitational waves. So there's your, your little grain of salt. And then we had a comment talking about corrupt matter, which is an old term for neutron star matter. 
no space for electron yeah. orbits, which I think we call degenerate matter often now. Yeah, yeah, or uh, post-nuclear saturation, things okay. like that. That's very cool. Thank you to, uh, to that commenter. <laughs> so next question, are there objects outside the solar system whose gravitational waves that affects, um, that has gravitational waves that affect our orbits? And what would have the biggest effect? Uh -huh. I would say overall, the, you have to remember the scale that gravitational waves actually change things around here, which makes them so hard to detect. Remember that, you know, a human hair uh, to the entire size of a house is the sort of change that you're looking at. If we lived in the vicinity of a pair of merging supermassive black holes, uh, that would probably be different. But even getting to the point where you could actually see the effects and detect gravitational waves is pretty hard as on the, uh, on the scale of the solar system, the, the disturbance is very small this far out from where we're seeing them. Right, I think the point is here, we have to make these elaborate detectors just to even detect them. And so these waves coming in won't really affect our orbits per se. I mean, like you said, there would have to be something extremely close and extremely massive to us, which we don't know about, or don't think there is. Which we would definitely notice if there were. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. How could you get Lisa to follow Earth's orbit without a similar mass? Uh, <laughs> this is a very cool question. Last summer, I got to dig into the orbital mechanics of the Lisa satellites, and they are wild. Um, the, the actual nice thing here, and the, I think the heart of this question, is that there's a cool thing about planetary orbits uh, called Kepler's third law, I think, uh, the two folks who have encountered that a little more recently <laughs> want to back me up. Um, but yeah, and actually, I think you two could probably take this a little better than me as you're currently teaching a class that discusses it. I can explain it if you want. Mm -hmm. So Kepler's third uh, third law involves that um, the period at which an object rotates an, around another object is proportional to the centimeter axis or the distance that that object, like that big object, is to that other object. For example, um, we let's say the let's take examples of the sun and the earth. Each of them are separated by 150 million kilometers, and each of them goes by the span of one year. Um, then you go to Mars, and like you take the same distance from Mars to the sun, and you calculate it, and it will give you an approximate um, amount of days in which the period in which you'll find that it's close to the actual period of how Mars rotates one time around the sun. So it doesn't involve that much regarding mass. Of course, there's mass involved because a little bit of, because of gravity, but um, in the context of when you are, when a body is not much affected by another one close to it, and you have to, you technically have the and one body, one huge body and another body here, and one rotating around the other, um, you can establish an orbit however you want in uh, the solar system just by doing that, that type of um, orbital mechanics and just setting up the course necessary so that it can just rotate around that period. Anything else you might want to add? I think that, that pretty well covered it, just the idea that it's independent of the mass entirely, uh, which is yeah. why we can do something like that. Mm -hmm. Right, nice job. Um, so we got another one. Are you guys afraid of strange lips? So here, I believe we're referring to strange matter or exotic core configurations different than what we're normally used to. And I would say that, I don't know a ton about this and I'll pass it on in a sec, but first I would say I don't think we'd be afraid of that. I think, you know, any physicist would be excited to find any sort of new 
quark configuration that you know could create matter. But I'll pass that one on. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll take it next. Uh, I, I feel like, again, probably wouldn't be afraid of it. I, I don't know if that's as much of a commentary on the, the object itself as much as physicists and astronomers general lack of self-preservation when there's something really cool happening in the universe. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm scared of it. It would be really fascinating to find something like that. And then we have a correction here actually saying that we said that um, billions of miles per hour in our slide, which would actually exceed the speed of light. Ooh, that's, that's good to know. I probably did that unit conversion wrong. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you put that in there so you catch it, right? Yeah, yeah. that was a test, <laughs> definitely. No, yeah, uh, I, I messed up a unit conversion, professional astronomer. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Will there be new or improved gravitational wave detectors before ELISA is launched? Uh, do you want to take this one, Andrew, or I can? I actually uh, don't know enough about the future of the instrument side of LIGO. I've been the, the only research I've really started on is more computational based, so I'll have to pass this one on. Cool. Um, so Yes and no. Uh, the yes part of that is that the way that our current gravitational detectors, LIGO, Virgo, and now Kegra, uh, work is that we do an observing run where we're actively using the detectors to look for gravitational wave signals, uh, usually these last about a year. And then we take six months to a year off. Uh, we turn the detectors off, and I say we, I mean all of the people who actually deal with the mechanics of the detector, which is not something that I have the expertise to do, but I'm very glad that they do. Uh, but the, the folks who work in the detector will, will turn it off and they will do upgrades. Uh, so every, we, we just finished up 03 uh, in, in, I believe, March or April of this year, and will at some point in the future start uh, 04, observing around four, um, you can, kind of assume that 03 was the third one and so on going back in time. Uh, but in that interim time, people are upgrading the detectors. And with each year of break that we take off, uh, you know, you drop the floor to the lowest signal, lowest strength signal that we can detect by, you know, a few factors each time. And so every time that we turn the detectors back on for another observing run, they are more sensitive. Uh, to answer the new gravitational wave detectors before Lisa question, sadly, no. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess that's also yes and no. There, there aren't going to be any new next generation ones. Those are going to be, I think Lisa is really the first one of those. And then in, you know, knock on wood, the 2040s, 2050s, 2060s, we'll probably see uh, some of the next generation of gravitational wave detectors. But there are, uh, there is a, another detector of the current network that is under, under construction in India at the moment. And the, and I, I, something that we didn't really get into here, but the more gravitational wave detectors you have, the better you can tell where your signal is on the sky and the more confident you can be that you actually saw a gravitational wave. With one detector, you can't tell the difference between the detector glitching and a signal. With two, you can actually say that you saw a signal, but where it is in the sky, in the sky are these huge swaths. Um, with, say, five positioned very strategically all over the world, which is what we should have in about, you know, again, knock on wood, six, seven years, um, you can get extremely precise, uh, something we call localization. You can basically say, we saw a signal and it was there. Everybody point your telescopes at, you know, this little spot in the sky, as opposed to, hey, observational astronomers, you want to spend like the next two nights scanning the, you know, about a quarter of the entire night sky looking for this cool thing that we probably saw. Um, so that'll be, that'll be really cool. Uh, speaking of, you know, glitches in detectors and differentiating those from signals. I think it is about time to transition over to our activity today, uh, which Andrew will be able to tell you a little bit more about. If we have time at the end, we can always come back as there is quite a wealth of excellent questions over in the chat. Yes, yeah, so 
I'm going to introduce something called Gravity Spy to everyone here. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. So here is the Gravity Spy page here. And so I will um, just give a little bit of background about what this is. This is um, what you call a citizen science program, meaning it allows citizens and the public, people that you know have other jobs not working in science, to actually get involved in real science and make contributions to real science, in this case, LIGO. Um, so some of this, will, you can go on here and check out, um, this is just the about tab, and you can go on here and check out some of the background here. Gives a quick diagram of LIGO, which is lasers, as we talked about, and here's kind of what we're talking about where you're looking for, these are four kilometer laser arms here. You're looking for perturbations or changes in the length of this, this laser, right? Um, so you can go on here and read about, but here we'll get to something pretty interesting here. This was what an actual signal looks like, you know, to the astronomers here using their, um, their instruments and plotting it as a graph that we can understand, right? So these are the two different, um, in Hanford and Livingston are the two different LIGO stations or observatories. Um, and they use multiple, you know, two in this case, to confirm the, the data, right? Because you could have a glitch in one system, but to have the same glitch in two systems is, you know, almost a statistical improbability, um, you know, impossibility, right? And so there are lots of glitches though. So you, um, this program called Gravity Spy actually allows you to go through and identify glitches and possible, possibly real signals, even though the glitches, you know, often, you know, outnumber the real signals um, and make real contributions sorting through the data set, right? So the reason this is necessary is because the data set, first of all, has, is so large and has so many um, possible, you know, interesting points like you're seeing here, which could be a glitch or could, this is, in this case, it is a glitch, but could be a glitch or could be a signal. And for, cause this is just, you know, constant observing, right? Like, I guess you could say for a stretch, you know, many days, many, many months, right? Of just observing and you have all these signals to search through and computers are not always in the best at certain tasks like this, identifying patterns. The human eye and the human brain is actually better at identifying patterns than a computer is because we're more flexible. The computer can't think. And there's some sort of artificial intelligence stuff that we're working on, you know, to try and do st stuff like that. but the human brain is in general better at identifying these patterns. So if you actually go on Gravity Spy here, um, you can make an account, um, close this out. So all you have to do is sign up, here I am, A. Toivonen, and there'll be a quick tutorial you can go through and it'll teach you um, essentially how to start going through this. And then once you get going through the tutorial, um, you will be able to actually start identifying real signals here. So. If you take a look here, I'll kind of go through, it gives you categories, right? So it can help you, you know, distinguish between these different signals, which helps them sort um, these possible events, possible signals into different bins. And it's a, um, a statistical thing where many observers and many of you can go and do this and then it'll sort them. And based on, you know, the cumulative evidence of all these people, they can start to sort these, right? And then experts in the end can look at a smaller data set based on what you know, the citizen science researchers here have contributed. So we'll look at a couple of things really quick here. So here's one of the things, um, a possible glitch, possible signal. I think in this case, this would most likely be a glitch. And here's one of the types called a blip. And we have a whistle, a koi fish, which is similar to the blip, but it mentions here it has head, fin, and thin, and thin tail. Um, Oh, and I, I should I should give a little more you know explanation of these plots. As you can see here, this is this is the time axis, and this is frequency. So how fast it's beating, right? So um, how fast the signal is oscillating or repeating, um, similar to you know the different radio stations, right? You're talking about five ten versus five fifty. Those are different frequencies, right? Um, and so then the color represents the strength of the signal or the energy contained. So I should should give you some more information about that. All right, and then we got power line, which is another possible one. We'll click through this one so you can see. Violin mode harmonic. And then there's also a none of the above section for any sort of miscellaneous or 
I would say, unusual or unidentifiable glitches or possible signals. All right, so we can go through and now actually start identifying these. So this one we can play here. Oops. So I would definitely characterize this as a whistle. So then you just click on it and press identify. And done. And it should give you some feedback. So it's going to tell you here that our experts class also classified this as a whistle. And I don't think it's going to give you feedback every time because the experts haven't necessarily made it through all of these, right? That's the point. But in this case, I was able to get some feedback. Oh, okay, look at this one. So I, you know, this is, we'll, we'll actually, we'll play the time dependent part here. I am going to say that this is a koi fish here. We'll take a look at some of the examples here. I think this is definitely what we're looking for. Yeah. So I would say this is a koi fish. So we can identify that one and move on. We've got another one. Let's see. It's like another koi fish to me. Well, this is interesting. Let's see what I got here. I'm thinking violin harmonic. What do we think? All right. I'm honestly not sure. It's a weird one. Yeah, I would say that's a violin harmonic based on the movement here, but yeah, I'm not. I see just see the the repeats. Um, you see at five hundred. Mm -hmm. 1,000, I think this has to be a violin harmonic at the different frequencies. Oh, yeah, got some feedback on that one. <laughs> All right, let's see. And I would also put this one as a whistle. And so that's just to give, you know, everyone in the audience, you know, an example of how, how you can actually go out. And it'll, these will pop up too. It'll give you um, little information once in a while about, um, let's say, what causes glitches. This is perfect. I guess this will help you guys out right now. So glitches are signals from non-astrophysical sources. So this can be something like a vibration, right? Or from, you know, anything. Because we're talking about such small fluctuations in these mirrors, right? That are reflecting these lasers back and forth that you really, like the simplest things, the tiniest fluctuations can really cause a problem. If this one wasn't my, tomorrow, was it? what? I, I was going to interject that one of yeah, my favorite sources of uh, LIGO noise at the detector in Hanford, Washington, that I have ever heard about is there is a seasonal noise variation that they have to account for because there's a logging camp several miles down the road. And so when logging is peaked, they have to deal with the falling of trees and moving of trucks several miles away and include that in their noise calculations. This is something that if this was just, you know, kind of right underground and a car drove over, it would be enormous on here. I, it would, I assume it could detect you walking above it if this was just right below the ground. So that's just something to keep in mind here. So these glitches can be, you know, from just about anything you can imagine. But like I said, this is just to give you, you know, an introduction to this. It's called Gravity Spy, and it's actually on a site called Zooniverse, like Zoo, Z-O-O, -O, Universe. Um, and it actually has these citizen science programs for lots of different things. I know there's one related to climate change and also one, um, what's, what's that other one? Um, now, I'm, now I'm blanking on, I've done one other one. It's related to, I believe it's like class, what, what is that? Do you guys remember, what, what's the other one? No, we did it in lab, right? Do you remember? I don't know. I can name a couple off the top of my head. Yeah, you do there's remember a couple of Scout. Um, there, there's like the original Zooniverse, Zooniverse, Zooniverse projects that were uh, like Galaxy Zoo and things like that, which were looking at classifications of galaxies. I think there are also a lot of like bio, like biology based ones now. They've really expanded. right. Actually, Very I remember cool it's thing. the the exoplanet one, the transits. Mm -hmm, exoplanets. Really? You're looking at light curves, which is the light um, coming off of stars as you know possible planets pass, pass in front. So, like I said, this is called Zooniverse, and, you know, feel free to take a look at whichever one of these, um, you know, interests you, whether it be the, the gravitational wave ones, climate change related, or like I said, exoplanet, which, if anyone not familiar, an exoplanet is just a planet outside of our solar system, right? So it could be along around a, another star, or it could be a wandering planet. But um, 
just want to give you, you know, show you a couple different ways that you could contribute to pro um, projects like this because you actually can get involved no matter what you're, <laughs> you know, no matter what you're doing, if you're a student, whatever your job is, you can, anyone can get involved in these programs. So like I said, Zooniverse, take a look if you're interested. I think the really cool thing to underline with, uh, with stuff like this is just the fact that people put in all of the effort to create a Zooniverse project like Gravity Spy because there is no other way to do the kind of science that they're trying to do except to have a lot of people help them out. Uh, these mostly are things where people are very good at classifying these different sorts of things and making these identifications and even machine learning algorithms at this point just struggle because there are so many different kinds and the machines aren't quite as smart as us yet. Um, but you know, instead of having a scientist spend 50 years individually looking through all of these and by the time they get done, it's no longer relevant. If you have everyone come together on these really cool, big community focused projects, you can uh, individually help make some awesome science happen. All right, I think we do have about another five minutes or so here, just at the tail end. Do we have any more questions? There, there, in the chat? there was another question. Um, cool. How will Lisa be powered? Oh, solar. Uh, yeah, it's each detector. There are three of them. Um, has a big old solar panel on the top of it, and so it'll soak up the rays of the sun. Awesome. Okay. And. No other questions at the moment. If anyone has a question, throw it in chat here quick before we uh, conclude. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, we'll give them a few questions. moments. Uh, any closing thoughts from the folks here? Well, you know, thanks for tuning in. Like we said, Zooniverse, they need your help. So <laughs> if you're interested in that sort of stuff, like go have some fun and do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. Great. This was a very good presentation and I really hope that you guys enjoyed it and make sure to support this universe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. And we are going to hop off the stream now. So have a wonderful evening. Uh, and we will, in fact, hop off the stream the moment I find the unstream button. I guess <laughs> <It> is, <laughs> oh? you should tell them. So there's, there, there's this universe, I mean, one of these next week. Sorry, a universe at home, not a universe. Ah, yes. Uh, the It is not, in fact, next week, but it is two weeks from now. We are doing these for the rest of the, uh, good catch, Andrew. Uh, we're doing these for the rest of the fall on a, on a bi-weekly basis. So keep an eye out. We'll be, uh, we'll be doing one of these every couple of weeks. Uh, feel free to subscribe. That way you will get a notification every time we, we put one of these up. But otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you again. Now, you, goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.